So in this video, we will learn about one of the popular DevOps platforms called Azure DevOps. We will see what it is and what you can do with Azure DevOps platform, how to use it for your software development projects, and generally, how is this relevant for you as an engineer? We will see different features and use cases of Azure DevOps, how it all works and how you can implement the whole software development and deployment lifecycle with it. We will also review the Azure DevOps architecture and how it works in the background. And finally, we will also compare it with alternative tools and talk a bit about which of these tools you need to learn for your career with so many alternative options. So let's get started. So first of all, what is Azure DevOps? As the name suggests, it is a DevOps platform. It is a software as a service offering which was created to basically be a one-stop shop for implementing all your DevOps processes for your project. And it had many names before it became known as Azure DevOps. It was called Team Foundation Server, then Visual Studio Team Services. So it had a bunch of other names before Azure DevOps because it extended from existing services and tools. So it kind of got names of these tools. And even though it was for the same purpose, of implementing the DevOps processes, at that time, DevOps was still practiced by a smaller group of projects. So that's why the name DevOps never actually came up in the name of the platform itself. However, since DevOps became more mainstream and as it is now used in lots of projects worldwide, it was actually renamed to Azure DevOps, which it's pretty smart because DevOps is already a popular term. Everybody knows what it is. So just by the name, you know that it's a platform for DevOps, but it still sounds too general because what is a DevOps platform? DevOps is many things, right? So what is a platform for DevOps? And to answer that question, let's look at what Azure DevOps is exactly and how it helps in implementing DevOps processes. Well, DevOps, as I said, is many things. It is a combination of concepts and tools and basically anything that makes developing and releasing applications fast in an automated way and with high quality possible. So a project needs to implement DevOps practices in order to achieve an efficient workflow. If you want to go more in detail about DevOps and learn it in more depth, all its tools and concepts, etc., I actually have a separate video on that but shortly explained, it's to make the software development lifecycle as efficient as possible by fully or mostly automating it. And Azure DevOps is basically a technological implementation of that DevOps process, which covers the whole software development lifecycle. And it has features for each part of this lifecycle. So let's go through the steps or parts of that software development lifecycle and see how the various Azure DevOps features map to those parts. Now, what does a software development lifecycle include? It's not just developing the application or writing the code. It actually starts before you have written a single line of code. Because before coding, any feature or an improvement needs to be planned first, right? Mostly by a product manager. So the first step, is to define what we are developing and why are we developing it? Or in other words, what's the business value behind it? And there are several ways of defining the workflow of how the project team will work on the application, which roles they have within the team, how they will divide and split the tasks, etc. Two of the most popular workflows are Agile and Scrum. Many modern projects use one of these approaches for their development. So once you have created a project in Azure DevOps for your application, the first feature you will probably use here will be Azure boards. And depending on which workflow you use for your projects in your company, generally like Agile, Scrum, or even some basic workflow, you can choose the corresponding board for this project. Because as I said, Azure DevOps or any other similar platform is basically just a tool that gives you various features to implement whatever workflows you have in your company. So on Azure boards, you can create tickets or tasks for features, improvements or fixes for your applications as part of that agile or scrum processes. You can assign it to people, 
to work on and you can also track progress of those features or improvements while they are being developed. Now developers need to take that planned task and actually develop it, right? In that process, they may have questions about the task. So Azure boards can be used for communicating between the developers, testers, product owner, etc. within the task description. Plus it can be used to have an overview and transparency over the status of the feature as it is being developed. Who is working on it? What stage it is in? What's its progress status? Has it been deployed already? Etc. Now the application code that developers are creating is also part of that life cycle. Actually the main part of it. An Azure repository feature is what you can use in order to host that code. Now, of course, you know, the popular code repositories like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, etc., which are all based on Git. And that's basically an alternative to those platforms. So Azure repository also supports Git, which is the most popular version control tool. So developers can host their code in Azure repository and push their changes to it. However, the code repositories have actually evolved and became much more feature rich and just hosting code is one of the many features that they provide. So Azure repository also, it's not just for hosting the code as part of the DevOps lifecycle, developers collaborate and work together to develop high quality code. So in the repository, as part of the Git workflow, you have features such as pull requests, branches, various collaboration features, and so on. So when developer starts a task, they create a temporary branch. When done, they create a pull request and other developers can review and comment on the pull request. They can communicate and collaborate until the pull request is good enough to be merged into the main branch. Now this is what's called a Git workflow. So basically how your team decides to work on the code and to make sure that the quality of code is very good. And there are many Git workflows or the way teams use Git and all its features and different companies may use different approaches or different workflows. But the key point here is that with Azure repository, you have the tool that enables you to implement whatever Git workflow you choose to work with. Plus note that the repository and branches and the pull requests are all linked back to the feature task. So you see the activity and status of development there as well. Now, once the feature is developed and pull request is approved and merged into the main branch, it needs to be released, right? That's the reason we're developing the feature in the first place so we can release it and the end users can use it. So in order to release our code changes, we first need to test it and package it into an artifact, which is a deliverable that we can then deploy on the end environment. And again, DevOps is all about automating things and workflows so that it's fast and efficient. So this process of testing and building the application is done by an automated CI or continuous integration process. And for building the CI pipeline, Azure has what's called Azure pipelines section. Pipelines can be written in YAML, which means you can have your pipeline script as part of your code. The main building blocks of Azure build pipelines are steps. For example, if we want to test and package the application, we may have steps to run tests, package application, build an image, push that image to an image repository so that later it can be deployed. So each step will execute a certain command to run the test, to package the application, build a Docker image, and so on. And this is an example pipeline for building a .NET application which is a common type of application built on Azure DevOps platform since ASP.NET is also part of the Microsoft technology stack. In the first two steps in this pipeline, we test and build the application with .NET commands and then build the image with a Docker command. And as you see, we execute commands in script attribute. However, we have another option for executing step commands instead of scripting it directly in YAML ourselves. 
So in addition to writing the scripts yourself, you can use what's called a task instead. So what is a task and how does it work? In Azure DevOps, you have loads of tasks already available to choose from for different use cases. And they can be selected and configured using a UI. You can select the tasks directly from the list of available tasks on the right side of the pipeline's YAML editor and configure any needed parameters for the task. And when you have the task configured, basically you filled in and set all the parameters, you can add the task back to your YAML pipeline. It will be automatically converted and added as YAML code. And of course you can adjust or add any additional configuration to it. So here, for example, if you look for ASP.NET task, you will find one for executing various .NET commands like test, build, etc. And once configured, you can add the test task in place of the script. You can do the same for Docker. You can search for Docker task and find the one with build and push commands and add the task to your YAML pipeline. And this obviously can be convenient in many use cases because you don't have to know the commands exactly. You don't even have to know or memorize the exact syntax for the pipeline. And you also don't have to script the steps from scratch. So this basically gives you a simple um, and easier high level approach to adding steps to your pipeline. Now, this is a very simple scenario of a pipeline with one single job that has all the steps. But in practice, we often have more complex scenarios where we would need multiple jobs in a single pipeline. Let's say we want to execute the test step on two different operating systems. So we want to test the application on Linux and Windows before we build it. Or let's say we test and deploy our application on Linux machine, but we need a database for our application, which must run on a Windows machine. For this use case, we would need two separate jobs. Now I'm mentioning jobs, but we haven't seen a job defined in our simple pipeline yet. So what is a job exactly? Well, all these steps actually belong to one job and can be defined like this. So a job is basically a group of multiple steps. However, when we have only one job in our pipeline, we don't need to explicitly define it. That's why we could skip this in the simple pipeline. But when we have multiple jobs, we need to define them within jobs attribute. So we have multiple jobs, each with multiple steps. And now we can actually execute each job, so all the steps within the job on a different environment, also called an agent. So agent is a machine that will execute the tasks or the steps of the pipeline, like running the test, building an image, etc. And an agent is selected from an agent pool, like pool of Windows machines or Linux machines or macOS machines, etc. And that's why we have a pool attribute in the job to define what kind of machine we want to dedicate for that job. And as you see inside the pool, we can define a VM image that specifies what kind of operating system we want. And you can also specify what version of that operating system you want to run that step or that job. Another very common use case for multiple jobs would be if we have a set of steps that can run in parallel so that the build overall is faster. This could be running multiple tests that can run at the same time, testing different parts of the application so they don't have to wait for each other to complete. They can all run at once. So by creating multiple jobs for all these tests, you can actually run them in parallel on different environments. So overall, the main task of this build pipeline is to test the code changes and if everything is fine, produce an artifact that we can deploy. Before moving on, I want to give a shout out to Pulumi who made this video possible. Pulumi is a universal infrastructure as code tool. And the cool thing about Pulumi is that you can use your familiar programming languages, tools and engineering practices to deploy and manage your cloud infrastructure. You can use Pulumi for any cloud, but for Azure specifically, it has the most complete infrastructure as code support for the Azure platform and is the only one with guaranteed same day support thanks to Pulumi's Azure native provider. Pulumi can easily integrate into any CI CD platform, 
For Azure DevOps, they actually built a task extension that lets you easily use Pulumi in your CI/CD pipelines. It can be used with the Azure Pipelines Wizard UI or the YAML configuration. If you want to learn more about Pulumi, I actually have a separate video on it where you can see fully how it works in practice. And with that, let's move on to Azure Artifacts. Now, traditionally, depending on the application programming language, the artifact produced will be different. Could be a jar or war file for a Java application, a NuGet file for .NET application, a zip file, tar file, etc. And for storing these kind of artifacts, you actually have another feature in Azure DevOps called Azure Artifacts. And Azure Artifacts actually currently supports three types of artifacts, which are Maven packages, NuGet packages and NPM packages. So if you're developing and building your application with any of these tools, then you can store the artifacts produced in the build pipeline in the Azure artifacts. However, in the modern software development, we usually don't produce such artifacts anymore. To deploy them, instead we create Docker images as artifacts. So no matter what language you use, what tools you use, the artifact is always the same, which is a container image. So if you have 10 microservices all in different languages, you can still produce the same container image type of artifacts. And images actually need a dedicated type of repository. So if your build pipeline produces Docker images, you will connect your Azure DevOps to some Docker registry like Docker Hub, Azure Container Registry, etc., and basically store your images in that repository. Now let's say we successfully built our application into a Docker image. We pushed it to a Docker repository and now it's time to deploy it to the end environment. This would be the next stage of the pipeline, which is also called the CD or continuous deployment or continuous delivery. If you're not totally new to DevOps, you already know that at the heart of DevOps, there is the CI CD pipeline, which is ideally the fully automated process of taking the code changes and deploying it all the way to the production by testing and validating all parts of those changing from is the application functioning, is it secure, etc. And in that process, we have these two main parts, which is build stage and the deploy stage. Again, we haven't defined a stage in the pipeline yet, since we only had one stage with all the build jobs. When we have multiple stages, however, we need to configure that as well. So in order to create a complete CI-CD pipeline, we'll have the stages in our YAML pipeline script for building and for deploying the application. And by the way, we can use a specific type of job in the deploy stage, which is called deployment which is specifically meant for deploy job and has some features for that purpose. For example, it doesn't check out the code like job type does, etc. Now, when we are deploying the new application version, usually we don't directly deploy to the production. Instead, we deploy to intermediate environments. We test it extensively and gradually promote it to the production. When we're almost 100% sure everything is fine. Common is to have development, testing, and production environments. So we can have all these as separate stages after the build stage, deploy to development, deploy to testing, deploy to production. Now the code for deployment to different environments will be pretty much the same, except for a couple of parameters. So how can we avoid repeating the pipeline configuration code in this case? Or maybe we have multiple applications that all have the same pipeline logic. So we don't want to write the same pipeline configuration for each application in our company. Instead, ideally, we want to write that logic once properly and then reuse it for all the applications that may need it. In Azure DevOps Pipeline's YAML syntax, we can actually put any code that is repeated and extract it in what's called a template, which is a separate file and can be referenced in the pipeline using template attribute and it can even be configured with parameters. So it's like a reusable piece of configuration that you can reference in different pipelines. So you can split your entire pipeline into multiple individual files 
And these files can even be stored and managed in a dedicated separate repository. And as I said, all the pipelines can reference them. And by the way, you can have a template for a job, a step or stage. So for any of these levels, and you can also have templates within the templates, creating a hierarchy like this. Now, when you have multiple environments for multiple applications, it may become difficult to have an overview of what version of what branch is deployed where, or when the code was last deployed to a specific environment and so on. And that's where the environment feature comes in, which is part of Azure pipelines. We can create environments in Azure DevOps, which will map to the actual deployment environments. And then you can configure in your pipeline, which of these Azure DevOps environments you want to deploy to. So you kind of have this abstraction there. And once the application gets deployed to these various environments, you can actually view the deployment history per environment. So this can actually be some additional valuable UI feature that gives you a better overview of your deployments. Plus the deployment status can also be linked back to the original ticket. So you have that additional information for the feature or improvement to which stages or environments it has been deployed to already, which again can be pretty convenient. Now that deployment process or deployment part of the pipeline, which as I said, is called CD or continuous deployment on Azure DevOps can also be built as a separate pipeline called release pipeline. Interesting to note that many CI/CD platforms like Jenkins, GitLab CI/CD, et cetera, they have one pipeline for the whole process. So we have one file and one UI unit for both. In this case, it will be split into separate CI and CD pipelines. So the way it works is that you select a build pipeline that produces an artifact or you choose the already built artifact location or source and you create a release pipeline for that artifact. Note that release pipelines in Azure DevOps can only be created using the UI. So you have no YAML file for that. However, the pipeline structure itself is the same. You can create steps by choosing from available tasks and also have multiple stages like deployment to development, testing and production. So with release pipelines, you say when this build pipeline completes and successfully creates the Docker image artifacts, for example, trigger this release pipeline. So this way you chain them. But as I quickly mentioned, as the artifact source, you can actually use not only the build pipeline output, but also already built artifact from various sources. Now, generally, it's usually a better idea to always have one CI/CD pipeline defined in YAML instead of splitting that into two. Plus you have all the benefits of scripting your pipeline and making use of the reusable templates, etc. So the release pipelines is probably for more specific use cases. Maybe when you want to deploy existing artifacts from the artifact repository directly. But as I said, usually you should have one pipeline for the complete CI CD process. Now, an important part of an application release process is testing and you need to extensively test your code changes before deploying it to production. And of course, the more complex the application, the more tests you need. So in Azure DevOps, you actually have a dedicated section for tests. And here you can actually create a unified central view of all the test cases or many of your test cases that need to be checked before giving a green light to production deployment. And here you can create manual test cases or plans. So when a new feature is being released, a tester can go through these steps and test the application. But this could also be automated tests, which will be executed as part of the CI CD process. And the test reports from the pipelines can be published and viewed here. And the main advantage of this is that you have own centralized place with an overview of all the test plans whenever releasing your application, whether these are automated tests that were run in the pipeline or manual tests from developers, product owners, testers, etc. And again, you can see the results of those test executions in your feature descriptions to decide whether you can release the changes or not. And you can even view and run the test cases related to a feature directly from the Kanban board. 
Now the pipelines execute tasks like running tests, building an image, etc. And as I mentioned, you can execute these tasks on different machines with different operating systems. So where are those machines exactly and how do we get access to them to run our tasks? And which machines and which environment do we get? To answer this question, let's look at the Azure DevOps architecture on a high level. At the core, we have what's called the Azure DevOps services, a software as a service or a managed online solution from Azure. And that's the main part where configurations are made, pipelines and repositories are created and stored, etc. So these are own dedicated machines for those things. But the pipeline tasks themselves run on separate machines called agents which are connected to the Azure DevOps services platform. Now, who manages these agent machines? Well, Azure offers managed agents as well. So you can let Microsoft actually manage the whole setup for you, including the main service, which holds the configuration, plus the machines that actually execute the pipelines. However, in practice, many companies need control over these machines, plus they want to remain flexible and save costs, Maybe they have these machines on premise or even on another cloud platform. So they want to make use of this. So you have an option to configure your own agents and connect them to the Azure DevOps platform. Or you can even have a mixture of both. And this is actually a pretty similar architecture to what other similar platforms like GitLab, CI, CD, et cetera, look like. So nothing really extraordinary here. And since this is a managed service, of course, you have to pay for these services and using for these resources, but Azure DevOps uh, does have a free tier to get started with that basically includes a certain amount of free resources that you can use to get started with, including using managed agents for your pipeline jobs. Great, so till now we actually saw various features of Azure DevOps that map to different parts of the application development lifecycle, starting from planning the task all the way to developing and deploying it to the end environment. Now, throughout these processes, we actually have tasks that we execute on other platforms. For example, when we build and push an image that needs to be pushed or stored in an external image repository, right? Which is outside of Azure DevOps. Or when we deploy to a remote server, it will be on some cloud platform like Azure, AWS, or even on premise, or maybe we deploy to a Kubernetes cluster, etc. Plus, we may have the pipeline connected to the external code repository in GitHub instead of using the Azure repository. So for all these tasks, Azure DevOps needs to connect to those platforms, right? And normally you have credentials like username and password or access token from these platforms that you need to make available in Azure DevOps so that it can connect and authenticate itself with those platforms. Now, for those use cases in Azure DevOps, you have what's called service connections feature, which makes managing access to external platforms much easier. First of all, it's less configuration effort because you don't have to create these credentials in the respective service and then replicate in Azure DevOps. Instead, the credentials are created automatically when Azure DevOps connects to those services. And second advantage is that it's more secure actually, because service connections use short lived credentials, which as I said, gets generated on the fly when the connection is established. So you don't have to worry about rotating or invalidating credentials and so on. And the service connections can be created in the project settings section. So you have a separate section for administering the project. Here you can manage settings for all the features like boards, repositories, pipelines, test plans, and artifacts. Plus, as I mentioned, you can use self-hosted agents to run your pipelines. And this is also where admins can configure these agents as well. Now, after learning, all the various features of Azure DevOps and what the Azure DevOps platform even is, you're probably wondering if this is so great, why aren't all the projects using it? Or is it that great? And what is the difference from other similar platforms like AWS or GitLab, etc.? And which one are you supposed to learn? Should you become an expert in Azure DevOps and ignore all other tools? 
So let's look at comparison with similar tools and answer the question about which one to learn. First, let's compare it with traditional CI-CD tools like Jenkins or modern ones like Argo CD, Circle CI, etc. The main difference here is that these are exclusively CI-CD tools, right? So Jenkins, Circle CI, etc. They're specifically built to create and manage CI-CD processes. But Azure DevOps actually strives to be the complete DevOps platform, not only the CI-CD. So any feature you need for covering the whole DevOps process, including the CI-CD, is in one place, which can be extremely convenient, as I said, because in DevOps you need multiple tools for different parts of the process, like Jenkins for build, code repository, Jira board, artifact repository, etc., which means you need to integrate these tools together. So you have an effort in putting all these tools together, like connecting Git repository with Jenkins, connecting Jenkins with Jira to update status of feature task, etc. So when you use a platform that offers these services in one place, obviously it's more convenient because they're already integrated. And plus you get a better traceability, meaning you have links between all parts of the process. Feature task has links to corresponding feature branch or pull requests to its pipelines, maybe the artifact that was produced with the version and so on. So you have a better overview because you have linked data from all features. A direct comparison to Azure DevOps is however GitLab, because GitLab, which started off as a Git repository, actually made a turn and decided to create an all-in-one DevOps platform as well. And to be honest, many of the features and use cases are pretty similar between GitLab and Azure DevOps, or generally how the things work. And if you're interested, I actually have a crash course as well as full course on GitLab CI CD for building complete DevOps processes with it. You can also compare it with AWS. However, AWS is way bigger and way more encompassing than just the DevOps processes. And here I want to mention an interesting note about comparing Azure with AWS and where Azure DevOps platform actually plays a role in that. As we know, Azure and AWS are both cloud platforms where you can create and configure your complete virtual infrastructure, create virtual servers, and use a bunch of other services as well. But while AWS has all its services on one place with one account, Azure platform and Azure DevOps platforms are more separated. So you have two separate accounts for them and you can manage them separately and even use each platform without the other. However, they're both obviously Microsoft products, part of the same ecosystem, so they have some integration. So essentially, they are still connected. So for example, the hosted runners for Azure DevOps run on Azure platform, as well as the code on Azure DevOps repositories are also hosted on Azure platform. And you can also integrate the Azure Active Directory, which is one of the Azure services in your Azure DevOps account. So they are two separate platforms, but integrated with each other for various use cases. And that means when you want to deploy to Azure virtual machines, Azure app services, etc., or Azure Kubernetes service from Azure DevOps, you basically have to connect to it just like you would to any other cloud platform to deploy to it. And an interesting use case in many projects, many companies is that projects who use Azure DevOps actually deploy to multiple infrastructure environments or cloud platforms. So they may deploy from Azure DevOps pipeline to Azure virtual machines and AWS virtual machines. And that's probably the main example that may answer the question of which technology you should learn or whether you should learn Azure DevOps. And the answer is usually companies that already use Azure platform or already use Microsoft services and products, they actually tend to use Azure DevOps as well. However, in terms of cloud technologies um, or cloud platforms, AWS is still the winner and number one in this category. And on the other end, in terms of the CI CD tools themselves, usually the open source solutions like GitLab CI CD or Jenkins, etc., are preferred uh, rather than using proprietary services like Azure DevOps. 
And very often you have a case where a company already has tools and processes it has been using for years. Like they work with Jira and Jenkins and AWS platform. They use internal Docker registry and GitHub repository. So they want and they can't just move everything to Azure DevOps. So as an engineer, when learning new tools, one of the things you should ask yourself is when you get a job, what tools you will most likely be working with based on which tools are mostly used by companies today. And as I said, tools like Jenkins, AWS platform, GitLab or GitHub platforms, etc., in DevOps are still the most commonly used ones and the leaders in their own categories. So you should definitely look at those tools first. And since many viewers actually ask that, that's the main reason why in our DevOps educational bootcamp, we teach exactly those technologies which are the most popular and most used in each category, even if there are cooler or better alternative tools um, for those technologies. But again, some companies that already use Microsoft services may decide to go for Azure DevOps, or you may be in a project or interviewing for a job where you need this knowledge. In which case, of course, you should learn and get expertise in Azure DevOps. Now, I hope I was able to give you clarity on what Azure DevOps is, and give you all the needed information to get started with it. I will add any relevant links in the video description so you can check them out there as well as share in the comment section whether you already have experience or have worked with Azure DevOps or what is your experience with any comparative tools and which one you would recommend. And with that, thank you for watching and see you in the next video.